Good morning, everybody. Just letting everybody get into the session this morning. Okay. I think we're good. Um, Dean, if you want to go ahead and kick it off. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm so excited that you are all here and we are here together. Um, so I want to just take a few minutes and welcome everyone to the fall term. Uh, super, super excited that we're starting OSHER uh, programming again, recognizing um, how much has changed and how much has uh, needs to be restored uh, in uh, all our lives in the last year and a half. Um, I just want to personally say that OSHER is a huge program for us. It's a very important program in the scheme of all that we do and in the larger strategy of where Global Campus uh, seeks to serve our community and, and partner with all of you in serving our larger community. Um, I think you, you, there, are been, there have been some changes um, and probably the most important change is that uh, we were very lucky to have the opportunity to take a step back and rethink about how we wanted to be together and learn together. And the most important step uh, for which we are congratulating luck and fate and uh, an opportunity in that we brought Linda on board as a special consultant to help us uh, do a nationwide survey of what OSHA programs look like, um, what were best practices that we can learn from, um, how to design the program for long-term success in a way that um, mimicked other programs in cities and environments that are similar to ours. And, um, we're very lucky that Linda was uh, able to join us and was willing to work with us. And so we ended up hiring an expert in not just our OSHA program, but really in sort of nationwide set of OSHA, or OSHA type programs. And so we're very excited about moving forward in seeing how else and what else we can do. Um, I know all of you are a very important part of the program. In fact, you are the program. And that's always been the case with OSHA. And we, in this coming year, we're really looking forward to resetting and regrouping around the initiatives that can only be led by the OSHA community. Um, that includes uh, advisory functions, it includes curriculum, uh, social and other such um, events and functions. Uh, with the recognition that, uh, uh, as you know, um, SDSU is reopening and our entire strategy is around safety. Um, we're going to have a massive focus on safety. We have all kinds of restrictions placed on gathering. Um, and we want to ensure that all of you are safe in the process of all of us getting together as a community. So that's something we'll be evaluating in the several months ahead and seeing how else we can set up some face-to-face uh, -face programs that are not uh, as risky as being in a room together. Um, but aside from that, we have an exciting lineup of courses. We're looking forward to expanding that massively. Um, and from SDSU's perspective, our goal is to ensure everyone's safety because one person's risk is everybody's risk. And so it becomes a collective initiative that is individually uh, practiced. Um, I'm very excited to hear from you in the next few months. I look forward to having conversations about how things are going. I want to learn more about how you feel about the programs we have and what else we can do. And um, as the term goes on, 
Uh, essentially, we're in an unknown territory at this point. Over the next several months, we will find out you know, everything that's going on with respect to public health, not just in our local community, but in the city, the county, uh, the state and, and the country in terms of uh, all the unexpected risks and our, our information that will come to us. And once that is clearer, we're very excited about also having more hybrid programs. Um, so I just want you all to know that um, I'm very excited uh, that we are here and a little bit nervous about what we all collectively don't know, but I know we can figure this out uh, in the coming a few months. And um, I, I look forward to working with you in the future. And I'm super excited to introduce Linda, uh, who will be covering um, all topics OSHA, um, including, of course, her background and everything that she has done, and um, uh, working with all of you in, in the coming months. Welcome. Linda. Thank you, Dean Shishin. Um, our OSHA appreciates your support, and I do as well. Um, good morning, everybody. We are so pleased to have the audience join us this morning. As Dean mentioned, um, I've had the pleasure of joining Global Campus last year as a consultant to develop a strategic plan and direction for the OSHA program. I worked closely with the National Resource Center for OSHA Long Life Learning Institute which is called NRC for short, who help the current 125 OSHA networks thrive by providing valuable resources. We have a few of them on the webinar today supporting us, so I wanna shout them out. Steve, Isabel, and Kelly Jane, thank you. The conclusion to my findings was OSHA is a very important program for the community. Aging adults need the opportunity for meaningful engagement and to continue to learn and grow. We have a large base of supporters and we can keep it going despite the challenges. Therefore, we are moving forward and relaunching the program. This wouldn't be possible without the support of the membership and that is what brings us here today. I know there are some past OSHA members, some current OSHA members, and some potential OSHA members here today. So welcome back and thank you for being here. We'll con continue today's event by introducing you to some of our instructors. Each of them will present a brief overview of their upcoming fall courses. Each has presented in previous terms and was originally vetted by our curriculum committee. After our instructors present, I'll share a few updates about what's new with OSHA at SDSU. As you might already know, online registration is open and you can call the registration office as well for any help registering or to register over the phone. Um, and we'll have time for questions at the end. So let's get started. Before I start the course of reviews, I just want the instructors to keep within your allotted time. It's important we stay on track so that the agenda and the event stay on time. With that, I'll turn it over to our first presenting instructor. Hey, good morning, everybody. Peter Boland here, as the slide says. Longtime OSHER instructor. I don't know, I was trying to look up when I started 10, 12 years ago, a bunch of different organizational structures ago, a bunch of different leadership teams ago but I still see so many great folks uh, here in the Osher family. And it's just a thrill to be back after what, a year and a half of suspension. So my two classes are six week classes. The first one's called um, the wisdom of Hinduism. And that is going to be on Wednesdays uh, mornings, 10 to 1150. And then uh, six of those in a row starting September 8th. The Wisdom of Buddhism then starts October 25th. That's a Monday afternoon, my usual old time slot, three to 450. So what we're going to do is sort of take, you know, these are 12 hour courses. And in each two hour session, we're going to divide up lecture presentation with Q&A. It's not going to be a webinar like this morning. It's going to be a regular Zoom meeting, meaning all of our cameras and mics will be on and we'll make it as interactive as we want. I mean, just 
to shoot if you have a question, right? And we'll 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 get into it. I'll have PowerPoint and and uh, we'll make it as um, engaging as we want it to be. And and to me, and I'll just talk about them together in the time that I have left. Hinduism and Buddhism are, of course, these ancient wisdom traditions from India from thousands of years ago that continue to really capture the world's imagination. If you've ever been to a yoga class, if you've ever said namaste, if you've ever seen a Buddha sitting anywhere, if you've ever wondered what's the connection between attachment and suffering, these are all the great, really lived and relevant questions that we're going to be getting into. So I hope to see all of you there for my two six-week courses of the wisdom of Hinduism and the wisdom of Buddhism. Um, thanks so much for the time this morning, everybody. I'll see you soon. Good morning, folks. I'd like to uh, invite you into shifting. I see that my video is not yet pinned. There we go. Hi, hi. Um, let's take, take a moment wherever you are, however you are. Take a little like uh, 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 to the side. Take a little uh, 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 on the other side, go a little forward, go a little back. This is not going to be a gift you to dance course, but we are going to be moving. Um, my name is Anna. I'm a lecturer in dance at SDSU, and I'm a choreographer. I'm a dancer. I've toured internationally. And in this course, we will talk and we'll watch and we'll even move just like a little bit together. Uh, dance in popular culture happens everywhere, right? Weddings, we've seen a protest on TV. Does anyone remember Soul Train? Um, this course is going to invite us to consider how dance can tell us about ourselves and our cultures. And in this pandemic, in this Zoom land with so much isolation, this class is going to be a community. In addition to situating dance at the center of cultural movements, we'll gather knowledge from our lived experiences, whether at your quinceanera or at a wedding, and learn from what we already know of dance and apply it to a greater understanding of the culture at large. So I'd be delighted if you would join me uh, this fall um, for a talking, moving, um, getting to understand ourselves even better together. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Kim Keyline, and I'm going to be talking to you about the Scottish play Macbeth. It is one of Shakespeare's most powerful plays. It was written specifically for him uh, by him for King James the uh, first, who had a great deep interest in witches. So are, there are three fabulous witches in the play who give a prophecy to Macbeth that he will become king. Now he is already quite ambitious. He wants to be king, but he doesn't necessarily want to kill for it. His wife, however, also ambitious and they're a very powerful couple, convinces him that he must take the step. He must do something in order to become king and fulfill the prophecy. And of course they do. And it leads to ghosts. It leads to uh, her basically going mad and walking in the night. Um, and of course, more prophecies that he doesn't understand until they are fulfilled and destroy him. It's an amazing play. And I would ask you to join me. We are going to be watching some short video pieces. I'm going to be giving you the context and history behind the play. And I will be discussing specific speeches and really giving you a sense of what makes this play one of Shakespeare's best works. So thank you very much and I look forward to seeing you. Good morning. Uh, this is John Spencer. I'm glad to be back with Osher again. I've had an enjoyable time working with the groups that I've met with before, and I hope you will join me in this venture. Archaeology and the Bible are both very fascinating subjects. Archaeology seeks to understand the past through the recovery of artifacts and architecture and materials. The Bible records the gro theological growth and development of Judaism and Christianity. And when one un uncovers something in the dirt while excavating, one explores or explores a passage in the Bible, they both require interpretation in order to understand their meanings. Archaeology helps us to see the world in which the Bible was produced. Archaeology provides a window into that past. 
Many times that window helps us to understand the references and events reported in the Bible. But at other times, the portrait painted by the archaeology does not coincide with the portrait painted by the Bible. In this class, we will look at the process of doing archaeology and the process of examining the biblical texts. Then we'll look at some of the places and examples where the two correspond, and then look at some of the places where they, they do not. The question then is how do we understand the times when they are a disparity? Hopefully, you will come away with a better understanding of archaeology, a better understanding of the Bible, a better understanding of the ancient world, and a better understanding of how the Bible and archaeology interact. This will be a very interactive course with your participation in it as well, and I look forward to sharing this with you. Thank you very much. Greetings, Osher. I'm Nadine Bope, and I'm glad to be back and offering two courses this coming fall semester. The first is a two-part course on world happiness. The phrase gross national happiness was coined by the King of Bhutan in 1972 when he realized that gross national happiness was more important than the gross domestic product. Bhutan also created a measurement tool that could be used for policy making and create policy incentives for the government, NGOs, and the businesses of Bhutan to increase everyone's happiness. So in 2011, the UN adopted a resolution introduced by Bhutan calling for a holistic approach to global development that promotes sustainable happiness and well being. This class will review the Bhutan story and examine the criteria used to examine world happiness. So we'll look at the assessment not only used by Bhutan, but by the UN to rank countries and finally to compare the 2019 results with the 2021 results post COVID. What changes have occurred from 2019 to 2021? Has the pandemic altered happiness in any of the various categories? Or have we changed our idea of happiness? And finally, who is more or less happy today? The second course is a four part series on the story of food. Part one reviews the origins of agriculture and the biogeography of edible, industrial, and medicinal plant species. What geographical and cultural part of the world various plants originated and how they become a global commodity. Part two looks at the issues surrounding fast food. This includes processed, packaged, ready to eat restaurant and street food. Fast and easy food has become a global phenomenon. Food preservation techniques, automation, and packaging has changed how we eat. Whether it's mass produced or to order, it's changed the human diet. Today, every culture has their readily identifiable favorites. Is it healthy, nutritious, or merely chemical junk? Part three investigates food insecurity, which is the disruption of food intake or eating patterns that's due to a lack of money or other resources. Drought and conflict are the main factors that aggravate food production, distribution, and access. Population growth and poverty also play a major role within the already difficult environment of fragile ecosystems. COVID has pushed an already fragile global distribution system to major global food shortages. We'll analyze the causal factors and some solutions to ameliorate this global problem. And finally, uh, part four deals with food waste, a growing environmental and economic and social issue. The National Resources Defense Council estimates 10% of the national energy used in the United States that goes toward food production, transportation, processing, and packaging. Food production also uses 50% of our arable land and 80% of our fresh water consumed in the US. However, there's still 135 million tons of food that's wasted every year. That's about 40% of our national uh, food production quota. On top of the soil, water waste, pollution of land, air, and water, and tons of chemicals from the fossil fuels necessary for food production exacerbate, exacerbates climate change and costs of about $165 billion a year. Unfortunately, Americans are at the top of the list of global food waste. If we reduced our food by only 50%, that would be enough to feed another 25 million people every year. This would also reduce hunger in the US and many of our health issues on a broad scale. So some food for thought, thank you.
So um, Wendy uh, couldn't be here. Hold on, Bruno. Yeah. Um, Wendy couldn't be here this morning. So I'm just showing her PowerPoint. These are some very um, current topics that you might be interested in. So please take a look at that. They're not starting until December and they're just lectures, but they're here for you to um, make a choice on which courses you want to join. And hopefully these are some of them. Bruno, you can go now. Hi, I'm Bruno Leone. Uh, I'll be teaching two courses. Uh, one will deal with disease in history in September and a two week course in October on Charles Darwin. And in a very, very loose way, the two will be connected. Now, Jared Diamond in his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, made the following statement. Because diseases have been the biggest killers of people, they have also been the most decisive shapers of history. And that's basically what my lectures will be about, especially the one uh, entitled The Immortal Microbe. I'll be dealing with three of the most consequential epidemics, pandemics actually, that in history, the ancient Athenian empire was brought down by a typhus pandemic. The ancient Byzantine empire was brought down by a bubonic plague. And of course, the very infamous bubonic plague of the 14th century. Now, what I basically will be illustrating is not only how they have impact upon history, but more importantly, what was done to try to control them in their own time where they were living in basically the dark ages of medicine and in a way compare it to what's going on today. And what I've concluded, and this is more or less what Jared Diamond said in his book, that the fight against disease is ultimately a battle or a race in which there really has been no finish line. Now, as far as the Darwin lecture is concerned, I'll be talking about Darwin, his life, his theory of evolution by natural selection, survival of the fittest. But what I will then do to try to tie it in with disease is point out how ultimately Darwinian evolution favors the smallest of us, of us here on this earth, namely the microbes. Somehow or other, they manage to create variances, mutate from time to time as a survival mechanism. And for the most part, they have been largely successful at it. So I hope I will see you in September and October at both classes. And I thank you for tuning in now. Hello there. I love being with you today. I'm excited about the relaunch of Osher. I'm a law professor and an undergraduate poli sci professor, but I always say that my favorite place to teach is Osher. Among other reasons, no one's ever asked me if whether what I'm gonna teach is gonna be on the bar exam. Uh, I have two long road tested uh, classes that I'm privileged to be bringing you in the fall. Um, both of them I wanna emphasize are, as other people have said, designed to be interactive, not just a lecture, but questions. And there'll be some examples where we go over legal hypotheticals and that kind of thing. Also wanna emphasize that the audience of my classes is always wide. Uh, certainly I love having um, uh, recovering lawyers in the class or whatever, people that know a lot about the constitution or law, whatever, but I also have a lot of people that are that are pretty new to it and it works either way. It's one of the nice things for me about teaching such a wide ranging group of enthusiastic students. Basically, um, both six weeks classes will focus on core areas of the law and core cases. The difference between them is the landmark cases class looks across the board, not only at obvious landmark cases you know about, Brown versus Board of Education or um, various key issues about free speech, et cetera, but how did the court give itself the power to engage in judicial review and invalidate Congress and the president's actions in, in 1803? And what are some of the core, but not really fully appreciated cases involving the power of the federal government and states' rights? 
um, and, the, and a number of issues relating to individual liberties. Speaking of individual liberties, what the second course does is focus down specifically on two of the core commands of the Constitution, the command that governments provide equal protection of the law, treat people equally, and, and also the demand of due process that governments both procedurally and substantively treat um, people fairly and non-arbitrarily and with transparency. And uh, in that second course, we'll be looking at some core issues uh, like abortion rights and racial discrimination and, and fair procedure. And uh, specifically, we'll be looking at uh, abortion rights as it's on the Supreme Court's term next year. So I will ho I hope you'll join me for uh, both or at least one of the courses. And uh, it'll be great to explore together the ongoing uh, important and controversial issues that um, apply to the Supreme Court and our Constitution. Thanks. Hello, um, I am Oliva Espin, and I'm going to be doing a four week uh, course on women saints. And um, those of you who have taken the course know <clears throat> that the course is not about religion per se. Of course, religion is in the background, but what we are looking at is some of these women, um, how they got where they got to be saints of the Catholic church. And that is a mixture of their personal psychological experiences and the cultural historical context in which they lived. And for that matter, that is true for all of us, uh, both women and men in our cultural context. I uh, have taught this course for a number of years, uh, but in 2019, uh, right before we all had to close down, a book I wrote about this topic was published. So some of the chapters of that book will be what we will be talking about. It's always very enjoyable. And I have been teaching at Osher since it first started and with the first director ever of the Osher program. And I enjoy it tremendously. So I hope to see you in the course in October. Um, so thank you very much. And um, we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. OK, so unfortunately, Blaine couldn't make it today, but he wanted to, um, for me to mention that the, this course was inspired in part by Blaine's trip to the South Pacific. He describes battle by battle how the United States ultimately defeated the Empire of Japan and ended World War II with the dropping of the atomic bomb. This uh, course is slated for Tuesday, November 2nd at 1 p.m. It's the uh, World War II in the Pacific, so hopefully you guys can check it out. There's more information on our website on it. And then something new we're doing, um, we are pleased to offer a discovery series in partnership with Sanford Burnham Previs. This series will have three to four lectures a semester with scientific trailblazers and industry leaders on topics from fascinating discoveries to the development of revolutionary therapies. Here are the lectures scheduled for this semester. They are very interesting and cutting edge on in cutting edge innovation that they with their cutting edge innovation they want to share with us. Um, so very interesting titles here. You guys can take a look. Um, these are also listed on our website for you to sign up for. So I would like to thank our instructors. Osher would not be here if it was not for you putting together these stim this stimulating content. Some of our instructors were not able to make it today, so be sure to check out our website catalog to view the rest of our courses at neverstoplearning.net slash OSHER. Also, if you have any questions for our instructors, please submit them in the Q&A section. If they are available to stay at the end of the event, they can answer your questions. Otherwise, we will email them after the event.
So here are a few updates and reminders for OSHER. Um, at this point, it shouldn't be a surprise, all our courses are virtual via Zoom. There are many reasons for doing this, but the number one reason is to keep everyone safe. Literally, the whole world had to make a shift on how they operate to continue to stay in business, and we are not any different. Many OSHER, other OSHER programs shifted, and all 125 networks have a virtual component. With the current rising COVID-19 cases, many of them are walking back their in-person plans for the fall. We are finishing some, <clears throat> we are finding some people like not having to deal with parking. And this really opens up an opportunity for those that were not able to attend in person, they can now participate. However, we know it's important, how important it is to engage your, with your member friends, and we have added a few options available to keep that aspect alive this fall. We implemented at least a 30 minute interactive session to most of our courses. Each course is a Zoom session, unlike this webinar now where you will be able to see and hear each other. Your instructor will initiate each class and you are welcome to give suggestions on what will work best for you all as a group. We know it's not the same as in person, but it can be just as good. The next option we are piloting, piloting is a shared interest group, a SIG. They bring together individuals who have a common interest that they wish to pursue. The content is designed primarily by the members of the SIG and supported by the designated facilitator. SIGs allow us to pursue interests we are passionate about and are very important across the country at other OSHERs. The example from another OLLI, they get together and go kayaking once a month. It could be physical or it could be as simple as a book club. It's up to you, you're the ones in charge. Uh, email went out Monday and it had a sign-up sheet available. So please take a look at that. If you're interested, sign up. If you have any specific questions, go ahead and email osher at sdsu.edu. Third, our initiative we have that you will hope you'll join us for are these new virtual happy hours. They are social hours held four times every semester on the second Friday of the month. While there's a lot of fun to be had in the classroom, it's important to have fun and connect with one another outside the classroom. Each happy hour will have a theme discussion. This is a great way to meet and congregate in a relaxed setting and build camaraderie and community. All the happy hours are open to members and non-members. These are just like classes, so you can register for these when you register for your classes. They're under the special events category on our website at neverstoplearning.net slash OSHER. So let's see. Every OSHER program is required to have at least 500 members per year to get the endowment from the OSHER Foundation. OSHER at SCSU is supported by that and the membership fees and contributions. To get to our goal, we need, to, we need the support of our membership. 80% of our membership comes from referrals. If you love OSHER and want to continue and want it to continue, reach out to your Rolodex, your neighbors, and even people at the grocery store. The more the merrier. While doing my research, I found that most successful OSHERs had an average of 200 volunteers. Volunteers are vital to the continued growth and sustainability. I hope that you will consider getting involved in any way, like trying out a committee meeting, bringing your knowledge to the group, providing warm greeting to other OSHA members, help develop things you want to get out of your OSHA experience. The possibilities are unlimited. Currently, we are in need of some Zoom class moderators. 
If you are planning to take a class and would like to work with the instructors to ensure the class runs smoothly, the email that went out on Monday uh, had a sign up sheet available. If you have any questions, please email OSHER at sdsu.edu and we will send you specific links if you need them from the email. There are many other opportunities to volunteer. These roles will be defined at the next OSHER orientation which will be scheduled between now and the start of the first class on September 8th. During this orientation, we will cover the mission background and of the institution, types of offerings, membership benefits in more detail, information about registration and SDSU cards and ID. Please be on the lookout in your inbox for more details. So there's a long list of member fit benefits listed on our website page under the membership section. But the top membership benefits include free student discounts to, or student tickets, sorry, to SDSU athletic events with the SDSU card. Details on our membership page on how to get that card are available. Um, second is you get half off the Amazon Prime um, if you sign up or switch over to Amazon Prime student. It's uh, $60 versus 120. Uh, it's very popular, a lot of people use Prime and you get delivery within two days. Uh, SDSU library, you get the interlibrary loans from any of the 200, or sorry, the 20 S, uh, CSUs, articles, journals, database, archives, access to the computer lab and library resources off campus are also available uh, when you get library access. And just please note that students are required to show proof of vaccination when coming on campus. More information will be available at the orientation and in an email on how to upload your vaccination cards to your account. When completing the registration process the first, for the first time, meaning you've signed up for membership and you've at least signed up for one class, you'll get an email after 48 hours instructing you to set up your SDSU ID. Follow those instructions. With the SDSU ID, you will receive an email address ending in at sdsu.edu. That email is proof that you are a student, and in particular, it will show at Amazon that you are a student and you will get the discount. Um, and it's um, some of the other organization that offers student discounts will wanna see this email. So it's vital that you sign up for your SDSU ID to get that. And then there are several ways that you can register for courses by phone, mail, online. Uh, currently, the in-person windows are not open. Uh, once they do become available, I will let you know. Um, but there is no in-person registration at this time. Um, that registration deadlines are normally the day before the first class, unless it's a trip. And refunds will be given out two weeks before the class starts. So uh, classes start September 8th. We hope to see each and every one of you this fall. I highly recommend registering today. You get the discount um, and it will expire today. So I'm just gonna move on to any questions if anybody wants to fill it out. In the Q&A, we have time. We are a bit early, so that's good. Always promising. I'm just reading a question. So if you're meeting, um, if you're meeting with SDSU students, you won't know if they're vaccinated or not, or not but that's only if it's on campus. So it's only required that you show proof a vaccination when you're actually on campus. So if you're using any of the membership benefits, um, you will, they, there could be a possibility that somebody will ask to prove that you've been vaccinated. And so um, there's a way in which, and people are still uploading their information right now um, into the system. So I'll get more familiar with that. And once I do that, I'll have more information for you, but um, 
basically you'll just say their name, your name, and it will show in the system that you have uploaded your information and you're covered. So with that, um, just more information out there. Things are changing daily. Um, so we're just playing it by ear as far as um, what's going on. Um, so somebody asked about student cards and if you can get them on campus. So no, um, the, the availability to receive student cards, um, I don't know for sure if they have their windows open because we are in the process of repopulating. Um, so basically, I'm just saying uh, it's not a good idea to go on campus because we're not 100% sure the windows are open or when that will happen. Um, on our website, when under registration, we talk about student ID cards. And so you can click on that link. It'll take you to their page. And one, it'll give you some updates on if the window is open, you can go there. Otherwise, since the pandemic, they have an online version where you can submit a picture, um, upload your identification um, so that they can double check you are who you are. And then they will, um, they will submit your, they will create your card and mail it to you. Um, that's been the process now. And like I said, things are all changing. It's still kind of up in the air on some of the systems and how we're going to move forward with them. Um, so as soon as I know something, I will let you know, but otherwise, um, every department will be updating their website and um, having that message there, whether or not they're available to assist you in person. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so somebody asked if they signed up for one term, can they switch to the annual, the next term? So yeah, this is something um, I didn't bring up for some reason and I should have, sorry about that. Um, we've added in an all-inclusive membership this year. Um, so for those of you who don't like, you know, individually going in and paying for a class, you know, you know, whenever you want and, you know, have to bring out your credit card and do all that hassle. Some, so, and uh, some members don't like that. Um, and, you know, you know, you're going to be signing up for a lot of classes. The all-inclusive membership um, will allow you to sign up as a member for the entire year. So from the date that you signed up to the um, next year, it'll expire on that date. Um, and so that will give you membership for that entire time and also um, access to all the courses for free. So that's the all-inclusive part. You can sign up. You do need to register. Registration is required for every single class. And you do have to register at least for one class every semester um, to, to continue to be noticed as a student or recognized as a student in our system. So please note that. Um, but no, if you decide to um, join for just this semester and then um, we'll open up another registration coming in January for that semester, um, you'll still have an opportunity to join at the all-inclusive at that time. So much more opportunities to join that. Um, who else? Somebody has a question, Ray? There are several questions under the Q&A, Linda. I don't know if you've seen them there. I haven't. So I'm looking at the chat because people are also putting questions in there. So yeah. it's really hard <laughs> to move through those. Um, Okay, will new or pop-up classes or events be added throughout the fall term? How will we learn of those? Yeah, so um, I, I want to add more um, in-person events outside um, in different locations within, um, within the community. Um, so I'll be looking, at, looking into adding those throughout the fall. We also will add other lectures and presentations as well. Um, throughout the fall. And the way you'll be notified is uh, we'll send out a newsletter um, and letting you know that they have been added to the course. So really a lot of the communication we'll have um, moving forward is email. 
to let you know what's been added um, to our catalogs. And you'll be able to see the catalog on our website. We won't be doing any printing of catalogs and mailing them out. What's great about the um, website online catalog is it's live, it's current, it's up to date. Once we uh, would print out a catalog, it'd be obsolete at that moment because things change all the time. So when you go onto our website, uh, neverstopdirtynet slash OSHER, um, you stroll down to the end of the page, it'll list all the courses, the different categories, and you can go quickly. If you just want to go to Arts and Humanities, you can click on that and it'll bring you down to all the courses that are there. Um, and then you can register through there very easily. Um, okay. I didn't see, I think there's other questions. I think we answered those in the Q&A section. I'm just looking to see if we have any other questions in the chat. And if you do have um, any extra questions, please put them in the question and answer. It'd be easier and everybody can see them. Yeah, and Ray, thank you. Put the link in the chat for our website. Let's see. And Ray, you said Edward had his hand up. I don't know how that works in the webinar. Um, Edward, if you have a question, just please put it in the q and A. Is there any questions for the instructors? They're still on. If you have any questions about their um, courses. Please put that in the Q&A. Um, let's see. see if I missed anybody. Okay. Okay, so as far as in-person classes and the plans for that, you know, before, um, you know, this, the rise in COVID cases and a lot of the other OSHER programs walking back their in-person um, courses, um, we were planning on doing some kind of hybrid um, in the spring um, and probably doing a third of our courses um, hybrid. Um, so I'm still going to look into that. I think we'll kind of see what happens over the fall, see where the levels are at how the university is handling everything, um, members being able to upload their vaccination cards this fall. So we can kind of get that out of the way. So when we come to spring, everybody's kind of taken care of and we don't have any issues with anybody actually joining us in person for classes. And I'm also considering having um, some classes off of campus. Um, so, that would be an opportunity, um, you know, other than going outside, um, because I think that's where we're going to be the safest is having events outside. Um, we might have an opportunity to visit certain locations and have event have an event at their facility or whatever facility we want. So um, that that's the plan. Um, things change all the time. So uh, just stick with us. We're doing the best we can for the situation. Like I've said before, we want to be um, we want to be um, safe, and that's our number one goal for everybody. Um, so then I have a question: um, How many courses are covered with the fifty dollar membership? So membership is membership. So when you pay for membership, whether it's all inclusive or um, the semester membership. Um, you get access to a, to um, sign up for courses. The difference is you'll be paying individually for each course that you want to take out of there. So um, that's the caveat between the two options. But there are options, and um, we found that some um, some uh, members like the all inclusive and just want to register for all classes possible and not have to you know, pay for each individual one that works out for them and they take advantage of that. And the other option is for those who are not sure um, and just, you know, uh, wanna 
want to see what happens and um, only, only sign up for a few courses possibly. Um, the prices for the courses vary depending on length. Um, so we have lectures that um, are two hours long and those are $20. So all lectures are $20 across the board. Um, and then uh, we have two week, four week and six week courses. And they range from you know, $39 to $89. So it just has an impact based on um, how long the courses go for. Um, the card office is open. You have to pay online before you go in. Okay, so somebody maybe has already gotten their card and is saying the card office is open, but you have to pay online. So maybe you're just picking up the card there instead of it being mailed. Um, but a lot of the departments are changing their policies and having everything kind of moved to online. Um, so it's just been the way that we've had to deal with the situation with COVID so far. And a lot of them is, is sticking moving forward. Um, okay. Let's see. Is there anything else any of the instructors have any questions or anything they want to mention to the students while we're still here? We got a few more minutes. Thank you for all the positive notes. Oh, let's see. Um, so somebody asked about being a, a Zoom moderator. Thank you so much for that question. Um, basically, we'll, do, we'll give you all the training that you need um, to make you feel more comfortable with Zoom. There's actually a free course scheduled um, second week of September um, on Zoom training. So take a look at that. Um, you'll find that in our uh, self-development section. Um, sign up for that. It's free. It's about an hour long and we'll go over all the main features that are important uh, for you to know how to use Zoom on, you know, not just being on the student side, but also on the, um, you know, the more access side of things, um, having controls and things like that. So there's that. And then also in the email that was sent um, oh, when you sign up, you'll receive an email. It gives you some information. It also gives you a link to some Zoom training that was done by the National Resource Center, the NRSC. And it has an actual volunteer from one of the other OSHAs that's on, on there. And she's explaining, you know, different steps that you need to do when you're doing the Q&A and how to handle those um, in the class. Um, and so it's just very particular on maybe two or three things that you might um, need to know in order to help the instructor. But if you already know how to use Zoom as a participant, um, there's not much more um, to do when you're just being a facilitator. It's just really um, kind of being the second person to um, help the instructor in case there's some issue. I know some instructors are better at Zoom and some are not. Um, so they have a better understanding of what's going on. And so sometimes you just need a backup if um, some of the technology goes down. So it's really, it's really to help us make sure that um, the classes stay up and running if there's any technical issues on the instructor's side and just whatever they might need from you um, to help back them up while they're um, teaching the class. So it's really a support person. And I think I answered when we have pop-up classes, uh, an email will go out to you, letting you know what courses have been added and giving you all those details. And then there was a question about catalogs and being mailed out. There will be no printed catalogs um, for moving forward for OSHA. It's all gonna be on our website. I think I answered those. Okay. I think that is it. We're kind of at time. I don't, I'm just checking to see if we have any more questions. Oh, um, video and audio and classes. So I've mentioned this, but um, this is a webinar. It's a difference uh, than a regular Zoom meeting where you can see my face right now. So you'll be able to see yourself, see other participants and speak to them. It's more of an engaging environment. Um, and that's what we're trying to push forward 
to move forward with all of our Zoom classes is trying to be as engaging as possible. And we understand that everybody has their own level of comfortability with Zoom. And um, you know we're here to support you and other students that um, know how to use it. They um, can help out as well, your OSHER members and OSHER friends. Um, but it's a community supporting others. And this is kind of, this isn't going away. You know, um, being online isn't going away and this is what we'll be um, incorporating and 95% or all of the other um, OSHERs have a virtual component in some way and they're continuing to keep that. So um, that's, that's what's going on. So um, I'm glad you guys are all here. I appreciate your time. Um, again, if you if I didn't if I missed your questions or you have questions for the instructors, please email OSHER at SDSU.edu and we'll make sure we'll answer those for you. Um, but otherwise, I want to again thank the instructors for being here um, and everybody that's online. Thank you for participating. And um, we hope to see you in class September 8th, first day. Thank you so much.